Welcome back uh, to the discussion series Varta Lab, organized by the uh, Center of Excellence in Te Teacher Education at uh, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, uh, Mumbai. As we all know, today technology is a buzzword. And with the COVID pandemic hitting us hard, it's taken even more a friend seat, a very crucial and primary seat in the lives of educators. So technology is around, but are we ready? So today to provide insights into this area, we have with us an eminent speaker, Professor Rajaram Sharma, a retired joint director of Cent Central Institute of Education Technology, NCERT. To provide a brief introduction about Sir, Sir has led various initiatives in exploring appropriate applications of ICT in education. He has also been very closely associated with the implementation of the national policy of ICT in school education, the development of national repository of open education resources and ICT in an education curriculum. So it is indeed my pleasure to invite you and welcome you, sir, on behalf of CET to take us through the lanes of technology and education with the vision of NEP 2020. Before I hand over to sir, uh, I would request that participants, sir, wanted a very interactive and engaging discussion, not a one-way uh, transfer. So please feel free to either raise your hands before questioning or put your questions on the chat box. And even before entering into the whole ocean of technology and education, sir would like to elicit some questions from you as to what is nagging you in this particular area. Thank you so much and over to you, sir. Thank you, Gomti ma'am. And uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. Now, the uh, to give you a general context of this talk itself, while we were discussing how we should uh, configure this, we realized that uh, the national education policy is on its way. There are various provisions within the national uh, policy, which appear to be goading us towards directions which we had not uh, taken earlier. And so we thought that it would be worthwhile to examine uh, some of the policy recommendations which are of relevance to us. I'm given to understand that mostly we have uh, teacher educators, practicing teachers, and perhaps a few of us who are preparing to become teachers. So in a way, the, the context is that all of us are uh, associated with school education in one way or the other. And we'll try to locate the stock within that context. Uh, so we are going to look at the national education policy. We're going to, in particular, look at provisions within the curriculum and pedagogy, teacher education, and then see how the expectations that have been raised uh, from technology uh, can be met how we can prepare ourselves for that kind of a future. This is the general context in which this whole uh, talk is located. But however, uh, if you believe that you would uh, like to raise a few questions, which sort of gives me an idea as to uh, the directions in which you would like this conversation to go on, I'd be happy to uh, receive those questions. And I request uh, Gomti ma'am to uh, collect those questions. And if you believe that at any given point in time, anywhere during the talk, you would like to stop me and raise that question, I'd be very happy to take that. So with your permission, uh, let me get into the presentation. So we have uh, the new education policy. It's already a year or so uh, since it was approved by the cabinet and was formally announced to the nation. Now, a few points of clarification about policies in general, about the new education policy. That a policy is a kind of a statement of intent. Any government, any organization, any institution which uh, intends to do something sets uh, a kind of a set of, uh, uh, let us say, aspirations, a set of uh, desires that it has and articulates that in the form of a, a document, which we refer to as the policy. And then therefore, I would, I would believe that these are not rules. These are not, uh, you know, 
actions which have been mandated for the nation, but more a statement of intent of the government of India. So when you try to read the policy, you shouldn't be expecting these things to automatically roll out. Uh, it is not an implementation plan. And in fact, if uh, some of you are curious to know how the, all the provisions in the policy are going to be implemented, there are two documents on the Ministry of Education's uh, website. Uh, they are called Sarthak 1 and Sarthak 2, which sort of detail out what are the various uh, measures that various institutions within the government are going to take in order to realize each of the uh, policy intents. So in general, uh, a policy is uh, aimed at providing a guidance to investments. So the government has to deploy money uh, and each time that particular government departments go back to the ministry and uh, claim or seek uh, budget supports, uh, this policy comes in handy uh, uh, for designing that proposal and for seeking investments. And it also in some cases, uh, as has happened in the NEP 2020, it will direct actions. It will it'll try to change certain things which are on the ground existing right now. Uh, and so uh, those changes are something that we need to look forward to. So the natural question to ask is that the government, of course, is going to go about trying to implement its policy. As a citizen, what should our role be? And I look at a citizen uh, not from a general point of view of someone who's on the road, someone who's into some other occupation, someone who is, uh, let us say, not associated with the formal education system, uh, perhaps this policy will have nothing to do with that person. Uh, but if that person happens to be a government functionary, a person who's in some sense associated with the schooling system, it could either be at a school level, it could be at one of those BRC, CRC, diet, uh, SCERTs, or in some of the institutions which are in the forefront of providing education or researching in education, or in some sense associated with the policy framework and its uh, implementation. It could be an NGO. Now, what is it that our role should be in this? One of the lazy roles that one can acquire for oneself is that we await instructions. We say, we'll, you tell us what to do and we will do it. And that uh, appears to be the easiest way out. And uh, perhaps many of us are going to uh, opt for that kind of a role. But it is my appeal that uh, one needs to proactively look at the policy recommendations, see if there is certain changes that have to, uh, that are not because I want it, but because it's going to happen in any case, I'll have to prepare myself for that. And if I am an institution leader, or if in some sense, I'm a, a, a part of a larger group of people within the institution, I may have to prepare that institution for those implementations. So uh, we, will, we will explore this further as we go along. And uh, many institutions, many government uh, organs have already initiated such actions. For instance, every state is going around preparing position papers on various topics uh, in the policy. They are also going ahead with preparing the curriculum framework. And I understand that uh, various states are going to prepare their own curriculum frameworks and then the national curriculum framework is in some sense going to scaffold all of these uh, preparations. There are many new initiatives which have been launched as a consequence of some of the policy directives, some of the provisions within the policy uh, for helping uh, the school system of the country. What if you are a teacher? What if you are a school owner, a school manager? What if you are a parent? Again, you might opt for Let's await implementation, let that happen. Let the 10th standard board examination format be announced and I'll prepare my children for that and so on. The other is to anticipate these changes and prepare for it. Uh, and some of these changes are something that we will get into a little detailing as we go along. And I again believe that it would be in our best interest uh, to check out what these changes are, check out the time frame in which these changes are going to actually be uh, implemented and uh, sort of uh, uh, work around these ideas and figure out what is it that 
is going to change and how one should be ready for those kinds of changes. What if we are an academic, a teacher educator, a researcher? What if you are in one of those NGOs which are in the forefront of uh, educational uh, transformations or working with rural communities or working with groups of people uh, to help them uh, seek education? I believe that this group of people in particular will have a much larger role to play, uh, not so much as a watchdog to this whole process, but to monitor the developments. When are things going to happen? What things are happening? How are these uh, things being received? How are they being acted upon? Uh, keep a watch on it, reflect on it, because I believe all of us have the role of a thought leader, someone who uh, thanks to the background that we have, thanks to the fact that we read a lot about various, uh, uh, not just policies, but also implementations of policies across the world in various countries, in various education systems, we uh, have the advantage of acquiring an understanding which is going to be slightly deeper, which is going to work around some of the ideas that are being uh, proposed. And we are in a position where we can uh, provide feedback, not just to the uh, implementing agency, but also uh, perhaps to people who are going to be directly affected by it. And I believe that many of us will have the opportunity and we should seek that out to participate and guide direction of actions. For instance, you might want to be part of the national curriculum framework uh, actions. You might want to be associated with textbook development. You might want to uh, help with the examination uh, reform part of it or with the technology implementations that are being or with inclusive education or with gender education and so on. So essentially, uh, this group of people, the academics, the researchers, uh, they have a much larger, much deeper, much uh, responsible role in uh, focusing the uh, people's views around the policy and its implications, and also to guide various actions that are going to emerge from that. So what is it that in the context of our conversation, and uh, I'm delimiting this to only those issues which uh, typically some of us teacher educators, teachers, uh, people in schools, or people who are going to become teachers in schools are going to be uh, concerned with. Uh, Amongst the policy recommendations are certain long-term structural changes uh, that are going to come about. There is this, uh, you know, the, the 10 plus two plus three system that all of us had uh, become accustomed to is going to be modified by the addition of the preschool uh, age groups into the schooling system with uh, the first five years of schooling being considered a separate uh, segment of schools and also as we go along uh, certain, uh, it, it's called the five plus three plus three plus four uh, system. And uh, so therefore it has implications for how, if I'm a practicing teacher, if I'm preparing someone to become a teacher in the uh, near future, and if this kind of a system is going to prevail, how am I going to equip the teacher to be functioning in this kind of a system? For instance, someone who was a primary school teacher to, uh, today, is suddenly going to encounter two more classes which are added up at the bottom of that uh, segment. And perhaps the youngest child that I'm going to be dealing with is going to be only three plus. Now, do I really know how to handle a three plus uh, child? Have I equipped myself for that? Do I really understand it? Okay, anecdotally, in, uh, intuitively, I might be able to pull that off, but then is there certain, uh, certain formal uh, learnings that I can engage with, which will help me become uh, better equipped to handle this. At the, uh, the the curriculum is certainly going to change. There is going to be a lot of changes inside uh, the the ways we are going to go about schooling. There's going to be skill education added in at the higher level. There are going to be various other smaller changes that will come about. So preparing ourselves for those is something that is suggested. Similarly, in higher education, there is a move towards uh, uh, conceiving of universities, conceiving of uh, courses within the universities differently. Uh, for instance, the undergraduate program is uh, recommended to be changed into a four-year integrated program. So uh, whether it is teacher education or whether it is any other discipline in education, the very complexion of these courses are going to change. Uh, there is a suggestion for 
creating institutions which are multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, courses which are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, and allow for multiple entry and choice based uh, undergraduate programs. What does that mean? Can I, for instance, join into a BSc course and halfway through that decide that I want to become a teacher? Can I jump over and uh, get into the teacher education course? What are the implications of this? Fortunately, none of these are going to be taking us, uh, you know, uh, unlike the COVID kind of thing tomorrow morning, nobody's going to announce that, you know, you suddenly your roles are changed. It's going to take some time. It's going to take uh, some conceptualization. But then I believe some of us who are interested in these ideas might want to be actually part of the reconceptualization of the undergraduate programs or evolving syllabi for it or, or looking at what multidisciplinary means, what interdisciplinary means, how it affects students, how, uh, you know, we can better equip them for the goals that we are setting for that. With specific reference to the teacher education program, uh, there is uh, an expectation that there's going to be a four-year integrated teacher education program, which will become the only model through which uh, teacher education is going to be done. Uh, so the conventional uh, courses that we have seen till date are all going to be modified, are all going to be transformed into an integrated teacher education program. And there are uh, options for lateral entry also. And uh, all of you have access to the policy document, so you should be able to look for what these changes are and keep abreast of what developments are happening in various institutions. For people who are in the forefront of institutional management, you might have a challenge of looking at what happens to your institution, what kind of faculty are going to be there, what kind of other resources do we need to uh, build around and so on. There are going to be changes to the curriculum framework. There are going to be changes to the teaching learning process and particularly evaluation. And, uh, uh, and so therefore, there are going to be implications of all of this for uh, people who are uh, within the school system and are practicing various uh, domains, teaching, learning of various age groups of children and so on. There are also uh, changes in the way we are looking at uh, special groups in the classes or the kind of uh, option subjects that are going to become available. There is a very large emphasis on skills education uh, which will have uh, implication on the weightage, implication on the kinds of topics, subjects that children learn and uh, preparing ourselves. Perhaps some of you might aspire to be uh, retrained into some skill areas and actually start focusing on those. Uh, there are changes in the curriculum and pedagogy, teacher education and technology for education, which is of immediate concern to us during this session. And I'll get into it a little deeper. There is this uh, move that the teacher education program is going to focus on and the curriculum and pedagogy in the school system is also going to focus on, on learning to learn. For those of us who have trained ourselves in education, this is certainly not a newer idea. Uh, we have always known that there are two aspects to schooling. One is to learn how to learn pick up the habits, pick up the tools and techniques of learning itself. Uh, perhaps language and mathematics uh, should be termed as, as those vehicles which will equip uh, children to learn various subjects. But we also recognize that in the larger school system, there has been an overemphasis on subjects so much so that uh, perhaps children are not being taught language and that the English teacher uh, tends to teach the English textbook rather than teach the English language. And uh, this is a culture that uh, the policy believes uh, uh, will be modified. How, what provisions will come in is something that we'll have to look forward to. There are uh, uh, re-emphasizing of creativity, critical thinking, logical decision-making and innovation, which will have implications for how the uh, topics are packaged, how the textbooks are written, how the chapters or activities inside the class are going to be treated, how the examination is going to test for these newer, uh, um, let's say newer objectives that we are setting for ourselves. So uh, there is an opportunity for all of us to start thinking differently about all of these things and perhaps contribute. Uh, 
the immediate implication is that children who are going to go through these kinds of programs uh, perhaps will have the ability to choose their learning trajectory, trajectory and programs. They might want to go to college, break out, come back again, or they might want to start with a skill area, then get back into uh, domains and so on. Within the school system, somewhere around the uh, grade 10, they might want to choose certain subjects which are today not available, but will become available as we go along. In a way, uh, the policy is a progressive uh, intent of trying to uh, meet the requirements of the job market, meet the requirements of individual uh, aspir aspirants uh, and develop their faculties in a way that they can make the most of the opportunities in the job market, opportunities in higher learning and so on. In the teacher education segment, as we mentioned earlier, there is going to be uh, a multidisciplinary perspective that's going to be brought in. What does it mean for the syllabus of teacher educators? What does it mean for uh, how we prepare teachers in our classrooms? What does it uh, have as an implication for the kinds of activities, the kinds of learning experiences we want to provide to the practicing teacher is something that we uh, may have to reimagine. And uh, there is also a, a, a big emphasis on the a continuous professional development of teachers. Till date, this uh, responsibility has generally been conceived of as training programs for teachers. And uh, you know the, uh, the, the conventional methods that we have had till date have not uh, been amenable to large scale training of teachers and uh, uh, continuous is something that we have not even been able to approach. So if you take a typical teacher who joins in somewhere around age 23, age 24, after having completed her course and stays on in the school system till she's about 60 or so, uh, the number of uh, such professional trainings that she can uh, access are very meager. And there are lots of specializations which have emerged over the last couple of decades, uh, things like, uh, for instance, evaluation, examinations, question paper setting, uh, valuation of uh, examinations itself, or uh, looking at very large data or creating multimedia, creating various other kinds of support materials for schools. Uh, all of these areas themselves have become very professional areas into which I as a teacher might want to branch off into, but there aren't any provisions today for me to do so, except by leaving that and getting into a system outside the school. Media organizations exist. And which is exactly why my uh, talk was titled, the technology is around for the last three, four decades. All of these technologies are available. So if, suppose I want to explore uh, animation as a way of uh, you know, delivering uh, teaching learning. Today, there isn't any provision for me to remain a teacher and try to explore these things. So we believe that uh, these uh, developments in the uh, policy are going to lead towards uh, more positive working environments and perhaps improved service conditions. Therefore, what are the expectations from education technology? The reason I say expectations is that education technology doesn't ride on its own. It isn't a subject that's going to be taught. It is going to essentially become the medium through which various other activities, various other processes inside the school system is going to be implemented. Uh, so we're looking at hardware, we're looking at software, we're looking at infrastructure development in a way, we're looking at processes being transformed to benefit from technology. And uh, so therefore, uh, this part of the recommendation of uh, the new education policy is something that we may have to get into a little detailing. So uh, it recognizes that technology itself will play an important role in the improvement of educational processes and outcomes. Uh, we will debate this point a little because I personally am of the opinion that if you allow technology to play an important role without the uh, concurrent developments in education, it is likely that technology is going to hijack this whole process. And a faulty process being uh, implemented through technology is only going to give you uh, worse results. And, and this is something I would like all of you to critically uh, note, and perhaps we might have a chance to debate it towards the end of this uh, talk. I'd like to stop at this stage because from now on, 
I'll actually be getting into what can we do to leverage education technology to address some of those things that we uh, put together in the curriculum and pedagogy and teacher education segments, and then try and see what does it mean to each of us as teacher educators, as researchers, as uh, academics of some kind, uh, what shall we do in order for us to be up to date for us to be prepared for some of the changes that are going to come in. I look forward to some questions or some interactions right now, and then we can continue further. You may please unmute yourself and ask the questions or you can raise your hands or put in the chat box, whatever you feel comfortable. There is one question on the chat asking about the accessibility, affordability and uh, of the uh, technology mm -hmm. uh, to the rural and the poor, how challenging it is and how do we make it possible? Okay. Incidentally, I had the opportunity of participating with the government of Karnataka in uh, evolving the position paper on uh, technology for education. And uh, one of the directions that we have taken is that uh, this whole process of trying to, you know, first of all, lay out all the infrastructure, make it available. And uh, it has been the history that uh, wherever this happened, there wasn't a corresponding software getting at the back of it or the teachers who were ready for using these technologies in the classroom in an appropriate manner. Uh, and uh, hardware simply became uh, junk. And we have, we have developed enormous amount of uh, electronic junk. So the direction that we uh, are proposing is that we don't look at it from that direction at all. Even without uh, any effort, the infusion of smartphones, for instance, uh, has happened. It is not because of any governmental direction. It hasn't been because there was a policy existing saying that all the people in the country are going to be equipped with smartphones of a particular kind and so on. But the very fact that it could do a large number of those things which people aspired for drove this kind of a, a change. So uh, the, the answer is uh, in two, two separate directions. One is that the education system, the formal education system shouldn't be so very worried about trying to create the infrastructure right now, but to try and see if it can create the demand for education at that level. Uh, demand for technology infused education, demand for technology driven education. And if uh, uh, that is put in place, and, and that's one of those things that we will be talking of in a little more detail as we go along. Uh, I believe that when, as and when we are going to put in the hardware, as and when we are going to put in the technology infrastructure, we will be better positioned to utilize it more optimally than we have been able to utilize till now. Given that, it might simply not be uh, within the capacity of uh, the system to provide for, uh, you know, some kind of predefined uh, infrastructure across all schools in the country. We have not even been able to provide buildings. We have not been able to provide electricity into those schools. We have not been able to provide a minimum infrastructure across schools, despite the fact that this is something that has been perhaps said in every single policy document till date. Uh, so that's going to take time. But nevertheless, if those schools have already got some infrastructure, what are they doing with it? What, what is it that can be enabled? What kinds of modifications can be brought in is the direction in which I would suggest or uh, we have been proposing that we start looking at education from that point of view uh, rather than look at providing the hardware first. Uh, also, today it is possible to ride a large number of software applications on the cloud, uh, make that available. All of us who are uh, very conversant with our smartphones have today started using applications which don't require the conventional desktop. It doesn't require that room in which you know, you're going to go and sit uh, to try and uh, wield technology. Connectivity is something that all of us have come to assume. Of course, there are very large geographical pockets where there is no connections. And uh, that certainly should be the direction in which we should be looking at. But I believe that if we can provide connectivity and connect people to the web, a large part of this technology vehicle uh, would already become available to people. After that, people's own demand for these devices will start pushing in 
various kinds of devices. And again, devices don't need to always conform to particular specifications. There was a time when we would uh, swear by what are the specifications of the desktop uh, computer that's going to be given to us. Uh, no more is it necessary. Even our smartphones are about 10 times more powerful than the first PCs that we ever handled. Uh, so that's the general direction that uh, I believe we need to be taking. There's another question asking expectations from teacher education in tech. Huh, that's what our talk is all about. So Technology. let's uh, wait for and, that. <laughs> uh, in, to add to it, and how can teachers who are better equipped with tech know-how facilitate mm -hmm. the process of technology? Yeah, that's, that's also going to be covered. So we'll, we'll wait for that. Shall I continue? Yeah, if there are no questions, you can. Uh, please uh, do uh, may, uh, feel free to put the questions on the chat box. In the meanwhile, sir can continue with the presentation. OK. So uh, I'm continuing with the presentation on uh, the expectations from education technology. And uh, some of you who had anticipated this kind of a thing, appropriate integration of technology into all levels of education. You see, these are uh, nice sounding uh, phrases, perhaps very good intent, but it will have to be supported by a lot of other planning processes, a lot of other uh, preparedness on our part before we can reach to the point where we look at integration of technology into education. For instance, if we are saying that today we are going to be considering the Anganwadi worker uh, to be replaced by a teacher at that preschool level uh, and integrated into a formal school. What kind of technology is going to be used with three-year-olds? Or if we are going to talk in terms of continuous uh, professional development of this teacher, uh, what kind of uh, technology devices are we talking of? Uh, so it would be, it would perhaps require a much more detailed elaboration of what uh, constitutes the use of technology in teaching learning before we start jumping to that point where we say uh, we are ready now to roll out education and this is this is something that all of us learned the hard way when we started using online education as the only vehicle uh, to bridge the gap during the covid times and uh, we we know what the consequences of that are and any one of us who have kept abreast uh, with the number of children who were denied education who were who were not not only because there was no access in fact many of those children who had good smartphone devices with them exclusively with themselves uh, could also perhaps not benefit from uh, what transpired on that medium. So it's not about the device. It is not about technology. It is about what happens on that technology, which becomes far more important. And uh, I believe that directions uh, of that kind will have to be insisted upon. And we as teacher educators and researchers have a role to play in that. So what are the propositions that I am looking at? What is it that I believe a technology can do to us as teachers or as teacher educators? Uh, there was this question earlier, which I uh, deliberately uh, postponed, which is to do with this whole concept of technopedagogy. There are people who believe, and uh, particularly those who are influenced by the Intels and the Microsofts and the Googles, all the salespersons coming and telling us that the revolution has already happened and that all you need to do is to access this uh, tablet or this uh, you know, device and so on. They tend to believe that technology is going to bring about the change. That a classroom which wasn't doing problem solving, a classroom which wasn't engaging adequately cognitively with the subject that was being taught, just because it now has an access to the internet or it has access to these 10 websites is going to suddenly transform itself to processes which were inherently not a part of that uh, classroom process. Uh, my own experience over the last three, four decades with uh, this kind of thinking has uh, told me that that is simply not possible. That technopedagogy rolls itself out completely differently in different subjects at different age groups for different purposes of education. And if these processes already exist, 
if teachers, for instance, have been working with large uh, data sets, technology provides a handle, it provides a convenience, it provides a way in which we can do things which are certainly magical, certainly things which we could otherwise have not done. But if we uh, try to believe that a connection to the internet uh, is going to transform, it is going to only transform the blackboard into a whiteboard, the whiteboard into something which is called a smart board, uh, making the children and the teachers in the class less smarter because the, the educational process that's going to transpire on this is going to shift the entire focus of the teacher onto operating a device and not uh, providing the learning experience that needs to be provided. She is not engaging with the content and therefore uh, this third party developed content, let's say for instance, you use a YouTube video to teach or whatever, uh, it, is, it is degenerating into something called show and tell. And this might not be the most suitable way in which learning is going to be transformed. Nevertheless, there are enormous ways in which technology can influence uh, the, the uh, complexion of what we teach, how we go about doing this. And be it the language teacher, be it the social sciences teacher, be it the teacher educator sitting here, uh, there are a large numbers of technologies which go much, much, much beyond the conventional uh, um, office package or a graphics package or a connection to some media resources on the web. And I, I certainly believe that all of us should try and keep abreast of some of these things. If not anything, look at it as a researcher. If you are able to bring together a large number of such resources, the very management of these resources, uh, something which I'm going to uh, explain a little further, is something which uh, we will have to prepare ourselves for. I believe much of us, for various reasons, we, we got into it late, we got a device which is not as equipped. Nobody told us that there are such things happening on the web. Uh, and we did not have the means to explore these things, are uh, using technology at a very, very trivial level. And this is not going to result in the transformations in education that we are seeking. The second most important um, use case, or rather the first uh, important use case that uh, we have seen very successfully implemented across in various disciplines, various uh, activities around, uh, is the use of data. The use of data, collection of data, compilation of data, dealing with large forms of uh, groups of data sets, and then trying to make decisions on the basis of that. Uh, we have some examples within education, but outside, if you take the railway reservation system as one of the pioneer uh, developments of this kind, or you take the e-banking today. Today, it is no more required that uh, you, know, you have any particular device or you require particular technologies to work with a bank. You have a mobile phone, it works. You have a credit card, it works. You have a, a point of sale device at uh, the shop that works. You can even scan uh, a, a board on the, uh, in the shop and uh, the QR code there uh, enables you to make payment. You can go into the bank, you can go into the ATM. All of these devices work with the same data at the back and enables you. And so you have a, a way in which the transaction is now agnostic uh, or rather the technology is agnostic. You don't require particular technologies to use this uh, possibility. Uh, very similar processes uh, in education can be brought about, but not so much about the device, but about the data itself. Every school is sitting with enormous data sets, enormous understanding of what those children are, what their developments are, what kinds of processes we are putting in. And it is high time that we look at creative, look at uh, uh, you know, uh, deep ways in which we're going to look at data and uh, allow these, uh, the, the kind of decisions that we are making in school be influenced by these data sets. There is this third and uh, for social scientists, a very troublesome uh, issue, which is that of uh, almost trying to convert the teacher into a technology, almost treating a teacher as some kind of a device through which the curriculum, the syllabus, the textbook, the course, the examination can all be pushed in to large groups of children. So the teacher loses her identity, loses her professional status in this whole process, and all the training, all the uh, you know uh, idealistic as aspirations that she has had 
are not being given that opportunity to blossom out. She is indeed the only point of contact with the children and no technology, no system, no larger uh, groups of people outside have the same influence, the same capacity to build up children, to develop capacities in children, to show them the world, to get them to participate in processes which enable their cognitive development, their emotional development, and so on. So to me, the uh, if, if I were to list out the goals for uh, uh, education and ask how technology can perhaps uh, service these goals, I would list uh, these three, uh, not necessarily in this order, uh, because there are uh, there are constraints coming out of the infrastructure that we are going to place, the constraints coming out of the preparedness that we already have. Uh, we will not have time to get into the technological complexities of each of these uh, uh, wish list that we are preparing here. But technopedagogy is something that certainly should be looked at. Informed decision making coming out of the data sets that we have with us or data that can be collected is uh, one other uh, area. And then most importantly, each of us teachers aspiring to recover our professional space, recover our identity so that we can uh, meaningfully reach out to children, uh, not at the instance of a system. We, we are not machines who are going to prepare children for the uh, 12th grade or the 10th grade or the CET or the NEET or whatever else that it is. Uh, but I believe that each of us as human beings are extremely responsible, extremely equipped to deal with individual children and help them grow. So how do we go about doing this? What, sh what should be the preparation for us and what is it that will help us go and do all of these things? Uh, you could be the teacher, you could be a teacher educator, you could be a researcher. All of us are dealing with information. All of us are suddenly encountering a deluge of information. Uh, while preparing this talk, I recalled that when I was doing my PhD, uh, uh, we had nothing called a photocopying machine in the college. And the journal would not be given out because the librarian was afraid that somebody is going to lose that book. The only possibility was that I would sit painstakingly, copy down a complete journal article uh, for two reasons. One is that nobody had taught me how to do note taking. All right. So if I had learned that, perhaps I would have been far more efficient at it. But nevertheless, I used to sit and copy down journal articles. The efficiency that could have come about from a process of that kind is something that you know. Now we are in the other extreme of this continuum. And today we have a surfeit of information. You, uh, at the click of a button, you have access to everything that you want. But please note that you are sitting inside a garbage dump. Unless you develop within yourself a way in which you're going to trap, you're going to assess, you're going to let in only those things which you believe are critical to your own understanding. Unless you act upon that information to build your knowledge, unless you are going to question that knowledge itself and try to juxtapose it with various other uh, information that you're going to get elsewhere, uh, you are not going to move further simply because you have collected 10,000 books and 10,000 books require about 10 minutes to download. That does not uh, result in uh, knowledge creation. And this is where our role as curators, our role as people who are going to make sense of that very large canvas that has become suddenly available to all of us is coming in. Whether it be for my own personal development, whether it be for uh, developing the student who is uh, uh, working with me, or whether it is to equip that student to go on later on to become that teacher and work. Curation is a process which all of us must concentrate on, learn. And again, technology on its own is not going to curate. I can list out 10 software applications or 10 websites or 10 you know, possible ways in which uh, information can be processed, packaged, moved around, uh, put into various kinds of collections and so on. But that's not going to help. The very process of when I use a keyword on Google, what keyword am I using? What results are coming out as a consequence of that keyword? Is this keyword appropriate? Shall I change the keyword? Shall I go deeper? How do I modify it? What newer keyword shall I uh, attach to this thing? And then when I download something, how reliable, how valid is the information that I'm getting? 
there used to be a time when we would we would believe that you know something which has been published something which is inside a peer reviewed journal something which has been coming out of some very big authoritative names in the world was all truth gone is the day when uh, such credibility is associated with information the only way i am going to not allow junk to get into me is by holding a good strong robust filter in the front and try and uh, act upon that information at that level reject it when it is uh, not yet a part of my system and then process it adequately for me to you know critically question it each time uh, check it out with various other things try and apply it that's the only way you can do that and uh, curation is not a question of simply collecting large amounts of information but about trying to meaningfully package that keeping the target audience in mind if i am working with middle school children what kind of curation should i do if i am working with high school children what should i do it is not only about media resources it is not only about teaching learning resources it is about learning itself it is about the kind of uh, uh, information the kind of data the kind of representation of this data that we need to look at so we are curating not just information but also software applications also the the devices that we are going to work with also the processes that are going to happen the kind of activities that are going to happen the kind of evaluation that's going to follow these activities and and so on and uh, equipping ourselves to become very good curators for the particular stage of children that we deal with or the particular domain that we deal with is going to be very useful as a part of our tool set continuous professional development is a goal that uh, the policy talks of but then this is something that we would have talked of in any case for every one of us and today it is possible for us not to be bound by the institutional arrangements that exist that the web is available there are online courses there are people to reach out to there are people who have already gone ahead and put in uh, their information uh, in the open and uh, some of them as creative commons some of them free and open source uh, resources out there uh, and uh, it is possible for us to reach out to all these people and try and get that knowledge that they have developed and uh, if lifelong learning is a objective of ours it should very well be supported by the technological means uh, that we have with us but again this has to be subject to the the first step we need to become very good curators of that information otherwise courses are dime a dozen you should be able to take a course on anything and everything but how good is that course how how strong is what that person's uh, uh, opinions are are they valid uh, do they work with my group do i have to modify it questions that we need to keep learning to ask and filter out information what this does is that it allows me to reach out uh, uh i am i am helping out a, a person who's uh, starting out with his phd work in uh, uh, related to social media and what we were trying to uh, argue there was that till some uh, years ago the only possibility for someone to be exposed to media information was to look at cinema posters perhaps big holdings if your city has one such thing uh, to get to know colorful uh, information or magazines uh, which were available or uh, you would go to a cinema hall to receive this slowly they started invading us within our houses and televisions became one of those uh, favorite uh, means through which such a thing would happen now it's even more dangerously close to us in the form of a personal device which in our privacy is going to get after us not that everything that comes out of it is negative not that uh, it should not be possible for us to filter out such things but preparing these young minds to be able to do so is a very big challenge that all of us will have to uh, take uh, note of find ways in which that can happen and then actively help children to learn to sift through all of this and uh, so therefore it's not just a cognitive uh, goal that we are going to set for ourselves there is also a personality goal there is also an emotional goal and unless we uh, help children with all of those aspects they are uh, likely to sooner or later become victims of technology which we certainly don't desire 
within the teaching community itself, there are uh, teachers who are going to be in very small schools, isolated from everybody else. We have heard of the single teacher schools, for instance, that the, uh, the very uh, process of uh, going out to the school in the morning and coming back from that school is going to be so exhausting that perhaps asking this teacher to do continuous professional development, asking this teacher to spend enormous numbers of uh, hours uh, curating information and try to become that small researcher who's going to help her children is, is certainly a very, very, very tall order. Uh, and these are teachers who require all the help that we can. And fortunately for us, one of those ways in which uh, technology enables this kind of networking in a way is to build communities of people. And these communities of people can become professional communities. It can become uh, communities where teachers are helping each other out, where teacher educators, where uh, people who know something about something are able to bring together uh, people and help guide these processes. It need not wait again for that formal training intervention, for that seminar to be held, for that conference to be held, for that event where I'm going to go and listen to someone. It is possible for me to sit where I am and reach out. So if not anything, at least pointing to each other, that information is available in this website. This particular information is very good. Here is this resource which can be used very well. If you want to learn about this topic, uh, go to this website and so on. Even if this level of initial activities can be initiated and slowly leveraged to become, uh, you know, to raise the uh, level of discourse in these uh, networks for critical transaction of uh, information there and uh, helping these teachers question the data that's available, question the material that becomes available to them and also help them figure out how technology can be used for teaching, technology can be used for learning and one is not the same as the other of how technology left alone with children can do wonders and how the teacher would enable that kind of wonder to happen in the classrooms. These are some of those uh, ideas which I believed uh, were very useful to us, are certainly going to be enabled through the policy and it might take its own time, but there is a, a fascinating future for us in preparing ourselves for that kind of uh, a world. And uh, I believe all of us, uh, should look forward to these kinds of things and, and figure out. Uh, but then finally, if I were to try and see how all of these things will package itself, as I mentioned to you, technology on its own will not uh, deliver. In fact, it used to be a very favorite uh, idiom in, uh, in computer programming, that if you put in garbage, you're going to get out garbage. And uh, that is even more true nowadays. Uh, and therefore, bringing in the transformations that we seek in education, in classrooms, in teaching learning, in helping children learn, in the resources that we have for uh, teaching learning, uh, that has to precede the choices of technology. Again, technology has changed so rapidly that it won't be right for us to be uh, looking at particular devices. Some of us who are more fortunate that we can throw a device out today and buy another one, perhaps are better equipped, but uh, a focus on devices is not the way out here. The focus on building up this curated list, building up the professional development avenues, networking teachers, networking people, and building these communities of practice is what is going to equip us with whatever devices we have uh, to make the most of the possibilities that technology can make available. I'll stop at this stage and we'll be very happy to engage with uh, all of you in a discussion. If you want to continue this conversation, do uh, send me an email. Thank you. Uh, I think most of the questions posted on the chat have been responded to. Yet, if anyone want to personally uh, extend that question or elaborate something, please feel free to do so. In fact, the aspect of professional development for teacher educators the way you have put it, sir, is really uh, welcoming because that is what is really needed today. Uh, some, some of you who have asked these questions because earlier, if you believe quite, that uh, uh, the, the answer was not, um, you know, completely answering your question and would like to repeat it, you're welcome. 
for instance, I see something about Divyang friendly education software. Uh, if you would like to ask, re-ask that question, if you believe I have not adequately addressed it, I'd be very happy to. That's just an example. Anyone asking any question? Uh, you Welcome. can please unmute yourself and ask the questions. There is one question that's asked, how has TEI, that is Teacher Education Institution, to start with preparing for NEP? <laughs> I presume that's what the talk was about, but I would welcome that person to perhaps clarify the question. Maybe maybe there was something else that that person meant. Yes, sir. The talk was very nice and very much in that direction. Myself, huh. Dr. Kauchal Yadav has asked this question. Huh. I'm a teacher educator uh, since last 25 years in a grantinate college in Ahmedabad, mm -hmm. uh, teacher's training college. Okay. So in which direction do we start for uh, national education policy 2020 at, as it demands a huge change or transformation in school education and same with teacher education all right let me let me try and sort of you know rephrase some of uh, the points that i mentioned around this idea you are not going to implement the policy this policy is not for you this policy will be implemented by the government of india it will also have implications for the government of Gujarat and the government of Gujarat is going to implement certain aspects of it. As a consequence of that implementation, textbooks are going to change, classroom structures are going to change, and the expectations from teachers are going to change. So if you ask me, what is it that I, sh I should do with my B. Ed. students today? I would say, look at these provisions, try and read and unravel it, try and understand what does this mean? What will my teacher be exposed to four years, five years down the line? Let me take you through an example. We talk in terms of a 360 degree evaluation that is going to happen in the classroom, or we're going to develop critical thinking in children. Now, what does it mean to this BA student? Should this BA student, first of all, be a critical thinker for him or her to go about trying to teach critical thinking or is critical thinking some kind of a subject that I'm going to download a resource and go and show a video in the class? How am I going to uh, pick up these things and then go and become a teacher who is effectively transacting some of the provisions of the NEP? So don't worry so much about what changes are going to happen, but worry more about what are the implications of those changes? Like I mentioned, there are suddenly going to be three-year-olds in my classroom. I'm, if I am a primary teacher till now, first standard was the first class that I would teach. Now I'm suddenly asked to teach a class which is two years younger. I don't even know how children of that kind behave. Maybe, maybe I have a child of my own. I know how to handle one child. Do I know how to handle 25 of them? Do I know how to handle 50 of them? I know what their attention spans are. I know what their aspirations are. I know what their abilities are. Uh, what is it that I should do? How should I prepare myself for that? So if you are able to put yourself into these shoes and start thinking in terms of what is the implication of each of these policy recommendations, I believe you will become equipped to uh, deal with it as a teacher. Now ask yourself, I'm going to train someone to become this kind of a teacher, then what is it that you must be doing here? What kind of reading will you ask this person to do? What newer kinds of activities will you ask this person to do? What kinds of uh, newer methods will you demonstrate to this person? Do you have that in you? Should you equip yourself with some of these skill sets which were earlier not expected of a teacher educator? Uh, this is my recommendation. I believe that you need to work through these things and equip yourself to become a better uh, teacher educator. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So one more doubt I am having, huh. if uh, hmm. for me, uh, in the policy they have written that standalone institutes of teacher education institutes will hmm. be discontinued and they will be with the multidisciplinarity modes now. Mm -hmm. So I think the government has still not yet clarified the roadmap for that, right? Hmm. Hmm. It, see, if you if you read this document called Sarthak that I mentioned to you. Uh, this okay. is a document which is a kind of a implementation roadmap. And okay. in that, the many of these changes have been, uh, you know, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take a very long time. Mm -hmm. By 2030, 
we yes. are expecting the new teacher education courses to be in place. Likely that your state is going to take a little initiative and bring about these changes a little earlier, but there are institutional arrangements that have to be changed. Today, yes. for instance, you are working inside a college of teacher education, perhaps you don't do anything else. Hmm. Now, will you start the BSc part of that program or will the BSc college take you in and start the education part of it? What does that four year syllabus mean? What is that institutional arrangement that will have to be made? What are the kinds of credits that you are going to get? Who is going to teach both curriculum and pedagogy here? Now, all these things are going to take enormous amount of time to settle in. So I don't believe that that should be an immediate concern for any one of us, but okay. there are certain things that are going to change tomorrow. There are going to be new textbooks. There are going to be new uh, you know, methodology uh, expectations. There are going to be training programs which will become available, or you might be asked to host training programs for the teachers of uh, Gujarat. Equip yourself for those immediate things. Nevertheless, I would suggest you look at the policy and the Sarthak uh, document for you to get an idea of uh, in the immediate next one, two years, what is it that is going to happen in the next five years, what will happen in the next 10 years, what will happen and how you can prepare yourself for that. After all, you're also seeking this as an opportunity to become a better uh, professional in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Okay. There is a question about uh, how a normal classroom teacher can become a part of these communities. Uh, I, I believe that even people who are on the road today are a part of communities of people. What do they do? You will notice that they are forever on their mobile phones. Who are they speaking to? It's not that obviously they're going to be having only one number on their uh, mobile phone list. They have a network. We are referring to these networks and these networks today have become even more powerful with all the social media uh, platforms around, except that if they continue to share good looking photographs and say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, or uh, say, what is it that I cook today? Uh, that's not going to become a professional community. So it's a matter of who is going to initiate it. Any one of us can initiate it. If there, if there is already a group, you can ask to become a member of that group. If there are a group of, for instance, you might be a science teacher, uh, uh, a large number of science teachers across the Sahodaya, for instance, in the private school system is one such example. We are only looking at an electronic analog because then that liberates us from physically coming in into a meeting or going and meeting someone or so and so forth. That electronically, where I am, perhaps I'm commuting back from school to home and I spend about half an hour to 45 minutes on a bus, I should be able to participate in this kind of a network. I should be able to ask questions. I should be able to seek help from someone. I should be able to uh, provide this help to someone who does not have this. Maybe there is someone who requires some explanation which you have, but you uh, uh, that person doesn't have. This is what we mean by saying creating this kind of a network. How big should that network be? It need not be an all India teachers federation kind of thing. There are 10 teachers, well-meaning people who, who believe they can be of help. These 10 people get together and solve their own problems. So imagine that in your chawl, in your, in your apartment block, you created a small little club which is sharing something today. It could be knitting, it could be cooking, it could be going together on picnics, it could be doing yoga in the morning, it could be anything. We are looking at analogous ways in which people can come together and professionally help themselves upgrade and start doing their work more effectively than what they would have done alone. This professional isolation is the target of this kind of a group. Uh, there may be lists of uh, you know groups of this kind, but I would suggest don't bother. Don't bother, you will come to know of it. Right now, you simply call out 10 of your friends who, who are uh, like-minded and set your own group, start your own uh, little uh, group on, uh, on Facebook or on uh, WhatsApp or on Telegram or whichever, whichever other channel that you are all very comfortable with. Start doing this. You will notice that you would perhaps become the, the largest such group. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, people who are in institutions, uh, uh, there, uh, there must be enough number of examples of other people. You can also do a web search on this to figure out what are those communities, but don't wait for that. Uh, very likely that there is an Australian group of teachers who are doing something and that might not be very relevant. It's certainly useful to peep in into these groups also to figure out what is happening there. You might want to become a part of those groups, but start your own group if one doesn't already exist within your community. 
just to come in here yeah uh, kamal ji we at our center do have a community of practice of teachers we do conduct uh, synergy with schools and school teachers so you can definitely contact us via email so we can you can be a part of the community of practice of teachers there was this question about ai in education and how much is it uh, effective uh, right now there aren't very meaningful applications of ai you look at it only in terms of large scale data being processed okay uh, we did a little experiment a couple of years ago uh, looking at the 10th standard uh, online mark sheets that become available to schools typically what is sent back to the school is a spreadsheet now the spreadsheet has data uh, of you know it's a typical listing of all the children what mark have they got in science maths english and so on all you do is use the graph drawing capability of a spreadsheet program and see what does this graph say how many of these children have uh, you know are clustered towards the bottom of the school who are these children why is it that after 10 years of being inside that school they are still there how is their mark in english contributing to their mark in social science or in science are their marks in mathematics in some way correlated with their marks in english you yourself as a teacher of that stage where were aware of who this child was can you say why this child is here at this stage if you are a school manager can you look at that data and think of how it could have been different how more and more children could have performed in that school now this comes about because you are doing this kind of a data analysis there is a possibility that over a period of time someone is going to give you more intelligent tools of this kind someone is going to give you an access to a web portal where all you need to do is dump in your data and then you will be able to figure out lots of things but let's not get carried away by labels that have started floating around somebody started saying data analytics now we say artificial intelligence and so on even artificial intelligence requires natural intelligence to begin with if we are not asking searching questions if we do not have meaningful reasons for using that technology the best of artificial education tools are not going to say anything almost for a decade now cbsc has been sending in these results in the electronic form have we benefited it from that have we looked at that data has it uh, after taking that print out and keeping it in a record have we done anything at all i as a science teacher do i know now how to teach science differently because my results over the last 10 years have been saying that kind of a thing these are the directions in which i believe we need to start looking at so that when the tool becomes available i am ready to jump on to it we could perhaps suggest to you right now if you if you already have made some inroads into this as to how this can be done but i believe uh, the focus should be on our own preparation for a technological future rather than looking searching for the tool to download today yeah so there is one question with regard to the rules of diets perceived in the light uh -huh. of nep how can the rules of diets be perceived in the light of nep okay i i don't know for how long uh, uh, alok ji you have been with uh, a diet but please ask what is that model of a diet i suggest you get back to the 1986 policy recommendations where diets were first conceptualized diet as an institution what is, what does it the name stands for diet is a district institute of education and training it's not educational training it is not training as the only wing you have a training wing you have a curriculum development wing you have a data and uh, various other kinds of information management wings you have five separate segments within the diet now ask yourself in each of those roles what is it that nep is expecting maybe there isn't a paragraph called diet maybe there isn't a particular place in which it is uh, saying such a thing but if suppose inclusive education is one of the goals and suppose in the context of your diet the number of brcs and the number of crcs that come under 
your diet or the influence of the number of schools that exist there what is it that you can do with influ uh, inclusive education or what is it that you can do with mapping of schools in that uh, place and looking at the dice data there or looking at various other kinds of uh, data sets that come from or if you are organizing teacher training programs what kinds of teacher training programs have you been organizing till now and how can they be modified to make it more meaningful to make it accessible to a larger group of people to find ways in which online education for instance can be delivered to them perhaps you are sitting in a place where uh, english is not all that prevalent in those communities perhaps you might want to take on that role of translating from uh, uh, some of the english resources into the resources of uh, in in the language in which your teachers transact it better perhaps you can start that little network around your uh, thing whatever is your domain whatever is your specialization you might want to start a little group where you invite teachers to participate if not anything look at the sslc examination results in your community and see how you can be of help to those children there are a lot of things irrespective of the nep that you could have done using technology nep gives you a little focus on that a little handle around that and by articulating that as a policy recommendation is appealing to you that you should also start uh, contributing alok ji have i uh, helped you understand your uh, question yes yeah, sure sir yeah yeah yeah, yeah. thank you thank you sir thank you uh, for anyone who wants to continue this conversation i suggest you use my mail id send me off a mail and we'll figure out a way in which we can uh, talk about it yeah are there any yeah. more questions or <clears throat> then we take a closure to this session yeah uh, thank you definitely sir has uh, enlightened us with a lot of uh, aspects with respect to technology and uh, in the realm of nep with the vision of n nep basically you know talking of technology is not the only deliverer it cannot deliver it just cannot deliver without our role the main role and responsibilities of teachers and teacher educators and very nicely he has given us a role of appropriate curators meaningful curators and uh, being lifelong learners you know professionally developing continuously so it's a it was a very enlightening talk sir and we took there is a lot of takeaways from this and uh, we hope to you know uh, implement this and incorporate this in our uh, professional lives i take this privilege to thank you for sparing your valuable time and coming here and giving us this talk and discussing with us and answering our questions very very thank you sir and uh, yeah and thank you audience all of you for participating here and posing your questions uh, we will come again with vartalap discussion series next month uh, tentatively around 10th march we will definitely email you the exact dates and uh, time and uh, probably mostly it will be around mathematics theme of mathematics education so see you all again uh, next vartalap